We left Matilda in 1125, now a 23-year-old widow returning to her father's court at Normandy. She had been a queen, a ruler in her husband's stead, and a wife. Now, she was at least still an empress. As a noble widow at this time, there were limited options for what Matilda might do with the rest of her life. She could become a nun or remarry. Although she had offers of marriage from German princes, she turned them down and gave up her German lands and estates, returning only with a large personal collection of riches and finery. Whatever future she may have had, she did not think it would be in Germany. Her father, Henry I, had already set in motion the wheels of that future. He was about to make a decision that would dramatically change everything. When Matilda returned to Normandy, Henry had lost his son and heir, and his second wife was yet to produce another. He wasn't getting any younger, and he wanted to secure his royal lineage. And so, for the first time in English history, he took an unprecedented step. He named Matilda as his heir to the throne of England. It wasn't unheard of in Anglo-Norman England for women to have some form of power, but only through their husbands or sons, holding it for them until they were of age or returned from war. Matilda herself had held such a position when Heinrich was forced back to the north of Germany to quell rebellion, leaving her in charge of his Italian estates. The English church had nothing to say on the subject of a woman becoming regent, only that a royal heir must be legitimate. Of course, nothing was mentioned about a woman becoming a female king, because the idea simply hadn't occurred in a patriarchal society that had very set roles for men and women, even noble ones. Nevertheless, in theory, there was nothing to prevent Matilda from actually becoming queen in her own right. There is some argument among historians about whether Henry I actually meant for Matilda to become queen in her own right, or if he imagined he would remain alive long enough to pass the crown on to a grandson mothered by Matilda. It is interesting that one of Henry's illegitimate children, and later Matilda's greatest supporter, Robert, Earl of Gloucester, did not seem to consider claiming the throne for himself. He was a popular noble, well-skilled and experienced on the battlefield, but he was illegitimate. Nevertheless, he was still the son of the king, so likely would have had a stronger claim to the throne as the illegitimate son of the king than Stephen I later did as merely his nephew. But none of the Anglo-Norman nobles protested when the king required that they swear before both Matilda and himself to support her claim to the throne, should he die before he had another son, which looked more likely with every passing year. Even though he had been married to Adeliza six years earlier and kept her close to his side, there was still no sign of any pregnancy. All of Henry's court were happy to agree to supporting Matilda's claim in January 1127. In fact, there was a fight over who should be first to take the oath. That honour went to David I, King of the Scots, the younger brother of Henry's first queen, Edith Matilda, and Matilda's maternal uncle. Next to take the oath was Robert of Gloucester, Henry's illegitimate son and the king's favourite nephew, Stephen of Boulogne, the same Stephen who had escaped dying on the wreck of the White Ship. They fought for who would be second to swear, a noteworthy contest, William of Malmesbury reported, from which Stephen emerged victorious. This would suggest that, at least at the time of the oath being sworn, no one had any problem with Matilda being a female ruler, and also that Stephen specifically did not question it. What was most important was that she was legitimate, the king's daughter, and also that she was still young enough to remarry and have more heirs of her own. However, for whatever qualities Matilda may have possessed, 
she was unable to carry out the two main duties of a king. The first was to lead as a soldier at the head of an army. There were examples such as Matilda Tuscany or Uraca of Leon, but they were not the norm. They were exceptions who through wealth and power inherited or given were able to break past the barriers placed upon their sex. Women were generally not trained to lead an army into battle with an unsheathed sword. The other duty was in a king's role as judge. Being able to pass judgment and settle disagreements was an important political aspect of being a ruler. Matilda had, of course, had experience of this when ruling in her husband's stead at Castro Caro. But this had been through the proxy wielding of her husband's power, not her own. In her own capacity, she was meant to be a merciful voice to temper her husband's wrath, an advisor, nothing more. There was no official position held by women in a public sphere to fill the role of a king. The idea of what made a king was intrinsically male. The very language used to describe royalty was a testament to this. A queen's very title, from the Anglo-Saxon word quen, meant the king's wife, not a female equivalent. Henry wasted no time arranging Matilda's second marriage, this time to Geoffrey Plantagenet, Count of Anjou. Named for his heraldic badge of the yellow flower of common broom, known in Latin as Planta Genista, Geoffrey was also nicknamed Le Bel, the Fair, for his handsome looks. He arrived in Rouen a week before his wedding to Matilda in June 1128 to be knighted by Henry I. He impressed all present with his slim athletic figure and fiery red hair. He was dressed in magnificent armour with golden spurs and a gem-covered helmet, three golden lions rearing on his shield, a likely prototype of the three lions of England's later coat of royal arms. However, he was also only 14 years of age, 15 years his senior, having been married previously to a far older man who had ruled the Imperial Empire and been King of Germany, it's unlikely that Matilda was impressed with a teenager who was merely a count. She herself was politically astute, had real knowledge of gaining and holding power, and had been crowned, in a somewhat loose manner, Empress Matilda. Hildebert, the Archbishop of Tours, intervened through letters pleading with Matilda to heed her father and go ahead with the alliance. Unsurprisingly, Matilda still tried to hold off on her marriage for over a year, but in the end, she had no choice but to submit to her father's arrangement, and the unwilling bride was married to her new husband at the magnificent Limans Cathedral on the 17th of June, their wedding celebrations lasting around three weeks. The couple then arrived in Angers, crowds cheering and bells ringing in celebration of the new Countess of Anjou, Matilda's new official title. Her father-in-law, Count Folk, left a year after the wedding to embark to the Holy Land, leaving Anjou to his son as he went to marry Melisande, heiress to the Kingdom of Jerusalem, earning himself a crown in the process. However, Matilda had other ideas. She disliked her title of Countess, preferring instead her much more regal title of Empress and Daughter of the King of the English. Despite the jubilant celebrations, Matilda's dislike of her new husband and their matched tempers meant that the marriage was off to a bad start. This was made worse by Henry I's silence on what his plans were for his new son-in-law, holding back on handing over the lands in Normandy that had been promised as Matilda's dowry. It would seem Henry was not ready to relinquish his complete control of Normandy just yet, especially as this would help keep the Anglo-Norman court on his side. Many of his nobles had lands on both sides of the channel and wouldn't want their lands in Normandy 
ruled by a young foreign count about whom they knew very little. Unfortunately, the couple's personal dislike for one another came to a head at the end of 1129, and Matilda left Anjou to live apart from her husband in her father's city of Rouen. And Geoffrey threatened to break the whole marriage apart and disappear on pilgrimage to Spain. Of course, Henry could not have let the marriage crumble before it had fulfilled its purpose for him personally, to provide him with a male grandson as future heir. He intervened to repair the coupling, and the pair were reconciled at a meeting of the King's Great Council in September 1131. This was also used as another opportunity for the Anglo-Norman nobles to renew their oaths of allegiance to Matilda, with her husband this time by her side. There was no doubt Henry I was stating to his court, Matilda is my heir, and her children are my future heirs. If not emotionally, then politically the reconciliation worked. On the 5th of March, 1133, Matilda gave birth at Limons to her first child, a healthy boy. He was named for his grandfather, Henry, and inherited his stocky physique alongside his father's famous red-gold hair. This was the future Henry II of England. Henry I was delighted with his new grandchild and came personally to Rouen to visit both his daughter and his grandson. Little more than a year later, her second son, Geoffrey, was born in 1134. But this was a difficult birth for the 32-year-old Matilda, and she became ill, very close to losing her life. She made arrangements for her will, but argued with her father over where she should be buried. Matilda preferred her beloved Beck Abbey, but Henry wanted his daughter to be regally buried in the great Rouen Cathedral. Thankfully, she recovered and went on to have a third son, William, in 1136. Geoffrey had done his part, providing Henry's daughter and heir with further heirs in the form of his three sons. But he had received very little in return from his father-in-law. Four years later, he and Matilda still did not have possession of the castles along the border between Normandy and Anjou and there had been no mention of whether he would receive a crown alongside his wife, as his father had done in Jerusalem. Henry was still unwilling to let go of his control over his domains in Normandy, but this was a risky move. If Geoffrey had ever been forced to fight for Matilda's claim to Normandy, this would have been a strategic failure, as they would have had little to no control over the territories. This was alongside it being something of a snub, as it was promised to Matilda before her marriage. As she found herself caught in a conflict between her father and husband, she this time sided with her once disliked husband, perhaps thinking of her sons and the claim on their inheritance if her father changed his mind about the succession. Events finally came to a head in 1135. While travelling to Lyon la forêt for a hunting trip, her father, Henry I, died suddenly. After eating some lampreys that didn't agree with him, the king grew ill and passed away surrounded by the nobles of his court, but not his estranged daughter. This was something that would later cast doubt on Matilda's claim to the throne due to their strained relationship. However, Despite the tension that had arisen between them, Henry I spent his final hours insisting on his daughter's right to the crown. But the speed with which he passed meant it was not possible to send a message in time to bring Matilda by his side, and his body was moved the next morning to Rouen Cathedral. His body was prepared as his barons and bishops waited four weeks for favourable winds to allow them to cross the channel. In that time, they discussed the succession, suggesting that perhaps Henry's nephew, Tybalt, the Count of Blois, might be better than a daughter who the king hadn't spoken to for some time. 
But while it would be easy at this point to dismiss their nervousness as Matilda was female, it was more likely they disliked her husband. Geoffrey was still a distrusted foreign outsider, and his father-in-law had never explicitly said what his role was to be in relation to the throne. Was he intended to be a king ruling through the right of his queen, as his father had with Melisande of Jerusalem? Was he merely intended to be a king consort? And what would that look like to a system that had no precedence for such a thing? The chroniclers who describe the events that came after barely mention Matilda. William of Malmesbury, the most sympathetic to Matilda's cause, recounted Henry's deathbed declaration of her right to succeed him. But her cause was harmed by her lack of physical presence at her father's death. Because she and her father had become somewhat estranged over the later months of his life, she was not poised to be anywhere that would have given her an advantage. Matilda wasn't present at his bedside to show she was a unified and dutiful daughter. Not being in Rouen in the four weeks after her father's death meant she wasn't there to smooth over any uncertainties about her possible rule. However, this is not to say that Matilda sat on the sidelines waiting to be called forward. As soon as the fateful news of her father's death reached her, Matilda wasted no time in riding north to seize the three castles on the border of Normandy that had been promised as her dowry, Domfranc, Exme and Argenton. She was so successful that she never lost these estates, and it was from these fortresses that her campaign to claim Normandy and England would be launched. But this was as far as she could go. Geoffrey was detained by rebellion in Anjou, while Matilda was unable to leave Normandy due to her pregnancy, which had begun only a few weeks earlier. William of Malmesbury states that she could not travel for certain reasons. Matilda established her household at Argenton, giving birth to her third son William on the 22nd of July 1136. Despite Henry's best efforts to secure his crown for his own line of succession through his daughter, there was nothing established for the situation Matilda now found herself in. Norman kings took the English throne by force, something that had been repeated by her own father. Their legitimacy was rooted in their retaining the crown by force and being in the right place at the right time, neither of which could be true for Matilda. Although oaths had been sworn and Matilda should not have had to fight for the inheritance set out by Henry, in reality she faced many hurdles. Being female meant she was hampered by not being able to lead an army or use force to retain a throne the way being male could. Her husband was a deeply distrusted foreigner to the Anglo-Norman court. And most importantly, Matilda was not present in England where she should have been to add weight to her claim. And while Matilda was stuck at her lands in Normandy and the barons discussed a succession of their own choosing, her cousin, Stephen of Boulogne, took the opportunity handed to him to take the throne without waiting. His lands in Boulogne must have made it much easier for him to quickly and decisively cross the channel. Stephen knew clearly what a successful claimant needed to do. He had to hold London and Winchester, and he needed to be anointed and crowned, if possible, by the Archbishop of Canterbury. He wasted no time in ensuring all three events happened, something made easier by the backing of the English church through his brother Henry, who was Bishop of Winchester. Stephen's claim to the throne was weak, in theory. Even within his own family, he wasn't the eldest brother, and therefore hadn't inherited his father's lands and title. And his royal blood came from his mother, Adela, the late king's sister. There were others with a stronger claim, such as Matilda's own great supporter, her half-brother Robert of Gloucester. He was illegitimate, but he was also the king's son, not merely a nephew. He was also an experienced soldier and was well-liked by the court. 
Stephen's other problem was that he had fought to be among the first to swear allegiance to Matilda in 1127. This now left him amongst those who could be accused of perjury for going back on his oath. But just as the king's main duties of might and commanding forces held Matilda back, they were tools that Stephen now put to good use. He had campaigned successfully in Normandy and Flanders, and was well known as a favoured and charming nephew of the king to the Anglo-Norman court. By contrast, Matilda had been a relative stranger. It is possible that he may have even been considered in plans for the succession since the drowning of William Adelaide before Matilda's return, even if not publicly spoken, especially as it would have been assumed that Matilda would remain in Germany as an imperial queen consort. Heinrich V's death and Matilda's second marriage had changed matters. Stephen's own prestige and wealth were increased by Henry I himself, when the king arranged an advantageous marriage for his nephew to Matilda of Boulogne in 1125. This was important in his race back across the Channel to be crowned, as control of Boulogne allowed him to offer use of trading routes to wealthy Londoners when he landed in England. However, for all of this, if the king had ever considered him for the throne, it wasn't publicly announced. The only hint of it was from three knights, principally Hugh Bigod, later the first Earl of Norfolk amongst them, who swore on oath that the king had, on his deathbed, stated that he wished Stephen to take the crown. It is interesting that after this event, Bigod took Norwich Castle for himself when Stephen fell ill in 1136, and when Stephen came to resolve this matter, he handed it over, but reluctantly. It was actually Matilda who later inferred the title of Earl of Norfolk upon him. Perhaps Bigod hoped for some reward for his oath, though it was never given, and he remained a difficult problem for Stephen long afterward. There was also the fact that no one else who had been at the king's bedside attested to this, and it was stated after Stephen had taken the crown for himself, in defence of his actions and not mentioned before. Doubt was cast by this because of the estranged relations between Matilda and her father, but it seems unlikely that a man who had played the long game with his son-in-law's demands and his grip on government, and who clearly was delighted with his male grandsons who would become his heirs if Matilda remained next to receive the crown, would suddenly make an impulsive decision on his deathbed after so many years of manoeuvring and ensuring oaths of alliance to his daughter. There can be no doubt, however, that Stephen was following the very example of his own uncle, Henry I. The pattern was the same. A younger son, not expected to take the throne of England, was using his military might and power to take an empty throne by force to bring, as he might see it, stability. The only certainty is that while the barons waited with Henry's body and discussed their own moves, and Matilda waited for reasons unknown in her French border fortresses, is that Stephen took his opportunity and wasted no time. The speed with which he moved might even suggest this was an already planned move, rather than a spur-of-the-moment twist of fate. No doubt he would be well aware of the difficulty in crossing the channel for others, and he would have the backing of the church through his brother. This is not to suggest necessarily that this was through any animosity to Matilda. No doubt, her feelings on the matter were likely not considered at all, but rather to his own position against the Count of Anjou, a long-time enemy to the Counts of Blois. He may even have discussed in whispers with the Anglo-Norman nobles who saw little of Matilda and distrusted Geoffrey, that perhaps a noble they knew well one who was male and well known to the king would be a better placement for the throne. To account for his actions, the Gesta Stefani, a history of Stephen written by an anonymous chronicler, declared that there was no one else at hand to help smooth the unstable chaos England and Normandy were about to fall into following the king's death. If only Matilda had travelled to England, 
and placed herself in the center of events, she may well have been seen as the calming influence that Stephen would now be cast as. Not only was Stephen to be seen as bringing normality, but also riches for those who might be swayed by them. His lands in Boulogne were the reason he had reached England so fast, and now he promised the same speed for trade routes to the wealthy traders of London. The wool trade was hugely important for England's economy, and he could promise ease of trading to the cloth towns of Flanders and France. The citizens of London were therefore happy to welcome him in as a king, but their attitude was affected by his promises of trade routes and promises of privileges for the city. And of course, his brother Henry, Bishop of Winchester, was happy to help his acceptance with the church and to hand over the keys to the royal treasury held in his seat of Winchester. Stephen also persuaded the Archbishop of Canterbury, William of Corbeil, to carry out the coronation. William was a loyal man who had served his post for a long time and was fully aware of the wishes Henry I had had for his daughter, the main reason why he hesitated to crown another. However, England was without a ruler, and Matilda did not seem to be in a rush to claim her throne. For the time being, Stephen appeared to be the king England needed, and the support of the Bishop of Winchester convinced William of Corbeil. Bishop Henry declared that Stephen would swear to restore and maintain the freedom of the church, something which Stephen later broke his oath to, like many rulers before and after him. This now presented a problem that had never occurred before. Two forms of royal legitimacy were in opposition with each other. On the one hand was Matilda's legitimacy through being the king's only remaining heir as well as one who had been given oaths of allegiance from the nobles of England. And on the other was Stephen, legitimised through his regal and deeply symbolic coronation, anointed by the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was crowned as Stephen I on the 22nd of December, just three weeks after the king's death. Even Matilda's uncle, King David of Scotland, could not get rid of Stephen. He invaded across the English border into Carlisle and Newcastle when it became clear how the throne had been usurped from his niece, but Stephen's forces were such that he soon put down the uprising and made terms. This also persuaded the nobility that they should support Stephen's cause, something that many continued to do when they were forced to choose sides. What the country needed, in the words of the jester Stefani, was a king who with a view to re-establishing peace for the common benefit, would meet the insurgents of the kingdom in arms and would justly administer the enactments of the laws. At his coronation, Stephen had promised his new subjects justice and stability, and he had brought it, crushing an uprising and forcing peace between two nations. The more he put down any opposition to his taking the throne, the more he was able to extract support from the nobles, and this in turn grew his legality to hold the throne and grow his support among the people. Even Robert of Gloucester, Matilda's half-brother, had to bend the knee and add his support for Stephen at Easter of 1136, and in return he had confirmation of his titles and lands. It must have seemed as though there was no other option, but this was to be a temporary situation. William of Malmesbury argued for Robert of Gloucester. If he were to resist, it would bring no advantage to his sister or nephews and would certainly do enormous harm to himself. Matilda was now trapped with her three sons in the frontier fortresses of her lands in France. She and her husband still worked together politically with regular raids into Stephen's lands in Normandy from Anjou. However, Stephen did not attempt to push them back in any way from Normandy's borders. Perhaps he was too distracted with matters in England, or perhaps, as Matilda had not moved quickly enough, he did not think them much of a threat. Either way, it was a mistake. 
Normandy disintegrated into chaos, lacking the centralised government of England that could allow the nobility to keep everything running smoothly in the king's absence. Or Derek Vitalis said, Stubborn Normandy, an unhappy mother country, suffered wretchedly from her viper brood. He was ruminating on the bloody conflicts that rose up between landowners, fighting amongst themselves. He continued, For on the very same day that the Normans heard that their firm ruler had died, they rushed out hungrily like ravening wolves to plunder and ravage mercilessly. And in 1136, Stephen's hold on England and its rule began to crumble too, during a siege at Exeter Castle. It was a particularly long and hot summer that year, and it wasn't long before the castle's well and wine supplies ran dry. Baldwin de Revere, the lord of the castle, had been a devoted supporter of Henry I and not bowed to Stephen. But he was forced, to save the lives of those inside the garrison, to plead for mercy. Baldwin's wife was sent out to beg for their lives, hair hanging loose and barefoot. The Geste de Stefani described the fate of the lady and those with her in horrifying detail. Sagging and wasted skin, the look of torpor on their faces, drained of the normal supply of blood, and their lips drawn back from gaping mouths. Surprisingly, it was actually the Bishop of Winchester who argued that Stephen should, in this case, treat Baldwin as the rebel and traitor he was rather than consider the humane response of allowing the garrison supplies of water. It was important, in his eyes, for his brother not to appear weak, which he surely would if he showed mercy to a man who resisted his rule. Others within the royal camp, unsurprisingly led by Robert of Gloucester, wanted to show leniency. It's not hard to imagine that his enthusiasm to show mercy might be closely linked to his dislike for Stephen, perhaps even with the intention to undermine his authority. If Stephen did show leniency, it would be Robert who seemed the hero of the hour, certainly not his brother Bishop who argued against it. It was well known that Stephen was a generous, kind person who had charmed the court, and while this held him in good stead when he wanted the crown, he was about to discover the downside to not being ruthless. He heeded Robert's advice and allowed Baldwin and those with him to go free. And this showed something highly dangerous for Stephen, that resistance to his rule was not futile and that it would go unpunished. However, Stephen had also not acted out of character for the time he lived in. He had captured his enemy's fortress and forced their surrender and when Baldwin decided to move on to his estate at the Isle of Wight at Carisbrook, he was again forced to surrender by the king's forces. It was a legitimate move that other rulers would have done, but with hindsight, it was a move for Stephen that would be another chink in his defences, especially when de Revere then fled to Anjou and sought refuge with Matilda's husband. This difficulty in retaining control and peace was reinforced just eight months later by Stephen's belated attempt to wrest back control of Normandy. The Anglo-Normans who currently stood behind him and supported him must have had a nervous eye on their lands across the Channel. They expected their king to keep his promises of stability and justice by retaining control of French territories. When Stephen finally reached the coast of Normandy, he was still 25 miles from the walls of Matilda's fortress at Argenton when he lost command of his army. Tension had built between his hired Flemish mercenaries and the nobility who now travelled with him. That tension spilt over into violence, culminating in Robert of Gloucester accusing Stephen of plotting an ambush to kill him. Nine months later, with no resolution or change in the state of Normandy, the king and his closest advisers fled back to England. Not only was Normandy still unprotected, but Robert was now firmly in his territories around Caen and Bayeux, able to build up his forces. 
in June 1138, the Earl of Gloucester publicly renounced his allegiance to Stephen and threw his lot in with Matilda. For Matilda, it was a game changer. Until this point, her husband had concentrated his forces only on the French lands under his wife's claim, leaving her isolated with their sons and unable to reach England. But suddenly, her half-brother's support gave her an army that could defend her claim in England and a cause that others could rally behind. Stephen's grip on power was faltering, which gave life to Matilda's fight for England's crown. <laughs>